Hello everyone, I'm Jenny Maz, TV reporter at The Wrap. Welcome to The Wrap's special screening series event, The Handmaid's Tale Crafts Masterclass, presented by Hulu. We will be kicking off tonight's event with a clip from season three of The Handmaid's Tale, and then we have a conversation with Natalie Bronfman, costume designer, Elizabeth Williams, production designer, Burton LeBlanc, department head makeup artist, Paul Elliott, department head hairstylist, Stephen Lebed, visual effects producer, and Sharon Bialy, casting. The event will conclude with an audience Q&A. Before we start, just a few quick housekeeping notes. I will be speaking with everyone for about 40 or so minutes. Afterwards, we will be taking audience questions for approximately 20 minutes. We encourage you to participate. Uh, so if you want to, just add your question in the comments section there, and the wrap team will post the questions as we go for the panelists to answer. And to be sure you're invited to future events like this, uh, please check out our membership service, Wrap Pro. Now, before we introduce everyone for our conversation, here is a clip from The Handmaid's Tale. Let's go. Everything that's going on in the world feels really, really relevant. It's gonna hold up a mirror, and it's also gonna create some really interesting conversations. And you and I will finally be free of one another. You will never be free of me until both my children are safe. There are moments in the show when the show and reality melt, and there are moments when the line gets really blurry. That day in DC, shooting those scenes at that spot, the line just disappeared. The government had been shut down. No one knew it was The Handmaid's Tale, or they wouldn't have allowed it. You know, you hear these things, and it's just so thrilling that they pulled it off. It's a powerful, exciting journey we feel for Jim. But I think we feel very, very united with her in that journey. You know, you don't have to be a wife or a mother if you don't want it. Who would I be? You. It's easy to decide you're going to do something. It's a lot harder to actually do it. There's no handbook on how to be a rebel. One thing that Margaret Atwood always says is that she hasn't put anything in the Handmaid's Tale, the book, that hasn't happened in history to some woman somewhere. I am who I am, and I have sinned plenty, but you, you are the gender traitor. And it's honoring the reality, and that's the goal. Here's what I don't get. If women don't want to be defined by their bodies, why are they always using them to get what they want? Maybe they aren't. Maybe men are just too easily distracted. I think the show is one of those generational shows. It leads. Welcome back. It is my pleasure to introduce Natalie Bronfman, Elizabeth Williams, Burton LeBlanc, Paul Elliott, um, uh, Stephen Lebed, and Sharon Bialy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. My pleasure. Uh, Hello. Well, we just saw in that clip a lot of faces that Handmaid's Tale fans are probably very familiar with, but they might not be as familiar with you guys, but they are very familiar with your work from being fans of The Handmaid's Tale, who watched this show. So I want to start out by talking about what we saw most about in that clip, and that was the trip to DC that we went to in season three, and that was a completely new experience for us as fans. And it had to have been a very new experience for all of you in your different roles, putting together what DC looked like in this world versus Gilead. So I'd like to go around first and start with you, Natalie, and talk about what the trip to DC meant for you for the show and your role and what you had to contribute there? Um, it was an amazing, and it was an amazing trip because I hadn't ever seen them all in, in live and the enormity of it um, almost, it took my breath away really as the sun was coming up and we were preparing all these hundreds and hundreds of women to get dressed uh, to see the size of this, um, this uh, mall. And we were filling it with women who were in showing us what it would be like to live in much more pious society than what was where the Waterfords were living, which if that was even possible, that's what we were showing them. Um, essentially, all the women were covered and we had to 
come up with a with a design that wasn't um, it was a fine line we had to walk without uh, creating any offense to anyone. And so essentially what I did is I tried to grab something from all of the different world religions to show that all of us at some point throughout history have covered up women, um, thus removing their voices. Um, it was an incredible journey. Um, and it was just the, the sheer fact that the government was also really, we were allowed to be there only for roughly a 24 hour period to get this done was incredible. Um, I don't even know what else to say about it. It was just breathtaking. Like I, I have so many photographs of the sun coming up and all of this just developed, you know, so. Uh, Sharon? Yes. Uh, so this was the episode, um, when we're talking in terms of casting, this was the introduction of uh, Christopher Milani's um, commander character, who is a very different kind of commander uh, than who we've already seen in Gilead. And, and those are extremists, I thought. Um, so so doing the casting uh, for the DC characters and introducing us to who these other members of this dystopian society are that are at another level from what we've already seen within the Gilead that we've known for years now. What what did you do when you were going about creating who we were gonna find to be these characters for the DC roles? Well, um, Sherry Thomas and myself and Russell Scott, we, we all do have a lot of conversations with Bruce Miller and Lizzie as to specifically the qualities they're looking for. And we really needed an actor who already exuded some power and strength without saying anything. and. Chris Maloney's name came up sort of just as like creative juices started flowing and it was very different from anything he'd done. And we were looking for an actor who would also add value and do something different with the role as his role progressed. Cause you don't always cast an actor just for that episode. You're thinking where the storyline's going and can that actor handle the arc? And most of the roles that are in the handmaid society are very, very complicated roles. So we tend to look for complicated human beings or complicated actors or those that can show a variety of emotions on their face when they're really still, as most of them are. Um, and especially with the women, uh, you know, with the costumes, you're seeing only their face. So what's going on behind their eyes, what's going on in their face is really important, just as important as what they're saying. And uh, so talking about the complications of, of those relationships, casting Elizabeth opposite Christopher, what was, well, this is him, what would his wife look like then and who would that be? Do you take that into account when you're coming up with what a couple in Gilead and outside of Gilead looks like? Yes, that definitely comes into account, but I think we look at each role individually as well and we try to find choices that might be surprising. I mean, we do a mixture in The Handmaid's Tale of actors people have never, you know, really America hasn't seen before or that are, you know, great working actors, but not household names. And in this case, we were able to mix that up with Chris Maloney, who's obviously a very well-known actor and so is Elizabeth Reeser. But oftentimes the initial introduction of a character on The Handmaid's Tale is very, very small. So it takes a an actor with some vision and trust that what's in that first episode is just going to blossom and open up into something much bigger in future episodes and that's a roll of the dice but i think elizabeth reese is a pretty smart lady and she was absolutely wanted to go there uh elizabeth yes um, can you tell me what changed or what changes had to be made or things that you had to think through in advance uh, doing the DC episode for production design? Um, well, a variety of things. Um, I worked closely with Stephen Labed here in, in, um, in basically modeling a, a 3D model of uh, the mall and uh, the memorial. Um, we started with that to see how to place our handmaids and, and using um, the, the permissions that we've been given, uh, which, which weren't many at the mall for our department. We were only able to bring a few props. We weren't you know, allowed to, of course, to, 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 to modify um, the brands in any way or even the steps. Um, so there was a list of logistical issue uh, to that. Um, and and the rest of the sets were all built in Toronto, actually. So other than that, you know, that one scene, um, 
at the Lincoln Memorial, um, the rest is all on location in Toronto. Uh, Stephen, that's a great time for you to come in uh, and explain the other side of things. And so working together with Elizabeth, how much of what we saw was real then? How much wasn't? What did you have to create later? What did you have to plan for in advance? What how, what goes into creating this fake version of DC and destroying parts of DC for this fake version of DC? Um, the, uh, God, where to begin? Um, <laughs> the, uh, we, you know, we started off. We started off scouting the location and trying to figure out um, what the shots were, how you know how they wanted to t uh, play the scene. And there was a ton of limitations uh, that the mall put on us as a production. Um, you know, we can only have so many people within the uh, monument at a time. Um, we couldn't shoot uh, on the steps. We couldn't. Uh, you know, uh, close down the mall at all. So while we're shooting, um, you know, we had tourists and people who work in DC uh, <laughs> walking around the area. And and uh, as soon as uh, the handmaids, uh, our actresses showed up in wardrobe, um, the, the crowd started building. Um, so, you know, a big part of, a big part of what you see in the show uh, had had hundreds and, and hundreds of of looky loos in the background there with their cameras watching, and we had to digitally remove all those people. We had to uh, recreate the backgrounds because um, uh, you know obviously when you take somebody out you have to replace it with something, um, and uh, yeah the uh, uh, you know we tried to keep as much um, of Washington D.C. as possible. Um, and just uh, as, as opposed to taking anything away, we just kept adding on top of what was already there. So Elizabeth had designed uh, banners uh, that we wanted to have hung in front of the monument and flags blowing in the wind. So we can only have so many uh, flags. We couldn't hang any banners. Um, so all those had to be created and added and, and post. Um, and uh, yeah, and then again, we only had uh, so many handmaids and the script called for thousands. So we arranged to have as many real, uh, act, you know, handmaids, uh, actors in rows and then digitally created new, uh, handmaids behind them to basically fill out the mall and make it feel like there's thousands. Um, and then, yeah. So. Uh, creating the um, destroyed uh, Lincoln Memorial, what did you, how much time did that take? How much like, like how did you go about creating in the first place? Like, well, this is what it would look like. Where would we cut it off? What would it look like to have been destroyed? We're thinking through how someone would have destroyed it. So what would it have, what was the process of breaking apart that iconic thing? Because it's amazing to watch um, Elizabeth uh, Moss do this scene uh, in front of it with Yvonne and have that fight, but it's in their background. It's impossible to not look at that and see them have it being a very jarring image that we know doesn't exist, but it's really disturbing to look at. Yeah, the, uh, in the uh, script, the, uh, and with conversations with Bruce and, Bruce and Elizabeth, the, uh, the idea was is that the, that, uh, Gilead had taken jackhammers uh, to the monument. And so uh, rather than just reduce the whole thing to rubble, you know, they, they uh, used heavy machinery to break apart as much as possible. Um, so, you know, we went ahead and, and uh, the National Park Service provided a uh, 3D model of the Lincoln uh, mon uh, Memorial. And we took that and, and added more details to it, basically built it up to make it match the real monument. Uh, and then went back and destroyed it, basically went through and started chopping away details. And uh, we kept iterating on that. Um, we'd show different versions of destruction and uh, uh, to Bruce, and he would come back with notes and uh, things that he would like to see us uh, keep, uh, things that he'd like to see us uh, destroy even more. And then the back wall, the uh, all the text on the walls and everything needed to look like that's been uh, defaced. So again, uh, we had to create a look that looked like somebody had taken, you know, saws or jackhammers or something to to make the text in, uh, unlegible. Um, and uh, yeah, it took, you know, the the problem with the with the particular show was is when we were planning it um, was during the government shutdown, 
And so when we were first getting to prepping the episode, we actually had a fair amount of time to plan out everything and, and get everything to work. Um, and then the shutdown happened, which basically meant that we couldn't shoot there. Um, and by the time we were able to actually shoot there, we only had weeks left to turn around all that work. So all that work was done within three to four weeks. Wow. It was. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and Paul, I wanted to ask you guys about your contributions while going to DC, um, but then you all are also nominated for um, your work in different episodes. So I want to come back to those as well. But when it went, when it came to going to DC, uh, were there any specifics that you can talk about for hairstyling, for makeup that you guys had to keep in mind for changes for what the look of people in DC would look like for Cecilia? Wants to go. Um, well, for me, the fun thing is there was limited crew going to DC and hair makeup. Paul and I uh, weren't one of them uh, <laughs> because of the US, the, the government shutdown at the time. But um, for me and makeup, it was just getting everybody and passing all the right information to the uh, person that was doing it down there to get all the makeup right and to get the, um, the wiring that was on the women's mouth. All those holes had to be lined up. Um, to make sure it was right for camera when a couple of the women, they did the, um, what was the wardrobe thing that would come down? Would come down and you'd see the uh, wiring marks, the hole marks. Oh. Uh, so that all had to be right. Getting all those looks matched up. And possibly all the right information to the people that were in, out in uh, Washington. But Paul and I weren't there actually. No. We wanted to be, but it was limited crew and it was a big you know, government shutdown. Understandable. So, there's a lot of prep work. Paul, to, to Paul, get, Paul. Uh, it, it, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of prep work to send off to them. We have, uh, Lizzie has a specific way of her hair being done underneath her caps. And, and so you, you take specific pictures. They see uh, the close ups, the sides, back, tops, right? everything that you require for them to do their job correctly and the way the show is. And I got to say, Boy, they did a great job, and oh, yeah. Yeah. bravo to them. They did. They did. Brilliant. Uh, Elizabeth, I wanted to come back to you real quick after talking with Stephen about the Lincoln BB thing. It looked like you had something you wanted to add to that. Oh, I was just going to add, um, you know, in, in the back and forth with Bruce and, and Steve about um, how he was going to be defaced, um, there was at one point to talk about how you know, as being a symbol of, of freedom and, and liberty for, for the United States to take away a head in the hand, therefore, you know, all possibility of thought and all possibility of action um, away from like the American people was very symbolic in terms of what the Gilead regime had, had actually done. So, you know, it sends a, in one quick look, it sends a very clear message of, of, of the power of this this new regime and and, and what it has done. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> oh, appreciate that. Um, so, uh, like we've talked about, you guys all have very specific different roles within the show, but you come together to create a cohesive look that everyone knows to be the handmaid's tale at this point. We all know um, uh, what a handmaid looks like. We know the colors, uh, the color scheme that's with the show. We, we've gotten used to advice. We're going into season four, whenever that can be. Um, so I want to know, and, and this is for everyone, um, how much you can speak to it, creating that look and how it's evolved. Um, as well, because it's not like the handmaid's um, uniform has changed, but but the show has evolved. So, what are there changes or things that you've done to things that we continue to see in Gilead is not making any progress, but the show itself is, and things keep changing and evolving. So, what changes have you seen on the show since the beginning? Who's that directed to? Uh, to any of you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, all of you. Something that I never thought of till just now with your really good question is what has evolved because, you know, obviously we're casting certain faces along with actors is I, we all paid attention in subsequent seasons and this season to the shape and size of a lot of the actresses eyes because so much was going on. So like, if you notice, I think I have the season right, like Sydney Sweeney, Ashley Lathorpe, 
they're, they have really big expressive eyes. Even John Ortiz this season who played the back, the, the flashback of Ann Dowd's, you know, lover. Mm -hmm. Not only are they expressive, but the size and if I thought of anything, well, what has changed in the casting, perhaps paying attention to that because it's such an important component in the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that, sorry. Go ahead. You know, one of the things that got, um, that keeps uh, growing each season is the scope of the show. So the first season, uh, uh, everything was all about uh, June and what she can see and, and the events that happened around her. Um, and each season we get to sort we get to see a little bit more Gilead. Um, uh, in uh, last uh, in the second season, uh, we got to see uh, sites like Fenway Park, and we got to see um, uh, more scope or you know uh, areas outside of uh, Gilead. Um, and season three, we, we um, got to see Washington D.C. and Toronto. So every season, the show uh, uh, gives us a, a, a bigger and bigger glimpse of the world. Um, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, that bleeds into casting as well because it, um, I think, as Stephen said, each season we're getting to see more and more family. Like this season we saw Yvonne Strahovski's mother. So we got to introduce Lila Robbins in that. You get to see family members uh, that you hadn't seen before. So that's exciting to watch the world spread and you know start to add more characteristics into the ensemble. But at the same time, when you have all the family, you get to see more brutality. <laughs> and the brutality is like, I'm on set watching this and it's shocking. <laughs> and it, it, it just gets bigger and stronger and relates so much to what the world is going through now. And I, man, the, it's just so incredible to watch it happen right in front of your eyes, to watch the actors do what they do and create what you've read and, what, and come up with what, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and it just, it's just so amazing to watch. And the same thing, uh Oh, sorry. That's great. Right. No, okay. so it's, it's, well, it's kind of, uh, you know, expanding on what um, what Sharon and Stephen said and you, Paul, as well, is that, you know, as June basically uh, takes each step away from that, the nest of the Waterford house, we meet new people um, and each, each person has his or her own environment. And each person has his or his her own family. I mean, if you take, I don't know, the Commander Lawrence and then his wife and all the Marthas around him. And, and it basically has this kind of ripple butterfly effect and it opens up the world. Um, and in doing so, it allows us um, to, to add layers and, and textures and, and even colors. Because as you'll see, you know, between season one and, and the end of season three and then again in season four, um, the world around June does become a little bit more extra is the wrong word, but um, maybe just colored, colorful. She starts to blend in a little bit more. And, and as she evolves, I mean, especially in the Lawrence house, it's like all of a sudden she almost blends into the decor. You start to kind of not see her as she becomes, as she becomes a rebel. Well, in, in tying into that, after what happened to Jezebel's, after she killed Winslow, the next morning, the dress was no longer a handmade outfit. It was a, it was a disguise because she was no longer that person. I mean, that is just one example how the psychology of the costume changes. The clothing that you now don are not the same. And I mean, my job was quite difficult in the sense that because I had such very strict parameters of color and they were very strict boxes for each faction, let's say, of these women, I had to come up with a different way of expressing sort of and continuing their story. Uh, the most glaring one in terms of, of evident is uh, Serena's arc, where she burns the house down. She's wearing some other lady's clothing. We see the prayer circle. We introduce a new color. Uh, and as she grows in strength, not only the tonality of her clothing changes to the very brightest at the very last outfit, the tailoring also changes. Things become sharp. There are angles. There are shards and everything. Uh, the outfit, when they're going to the B&B, &B, 
actually has a military chevron that is in it, in the jacket, and all the knife pleats at the bottom, for example. Um, so these are the ways that I could sort of play around with that, staying within the same parameters. With the handmaids, it was a little different because I had to then remove whatever little real estate was available that was still left that we saw in terms of skin, which was sort of just the neckline and half the face. So it was that kind of a thing as, as a progressive, you can see just everything started to become tighter and tighter, including with Serena. And the psychology of the refugees with Luke and Moira and Emily, their color scheme was sort of a little bit of a throwback to where they had once been, but it was not as bright anymore because that was sort of their comfort zone there. And in Luke's case, he wasn't thinking about what he was wearing. He was just trying to get through the day and get his family back. So that's sort of how we progressed in our department. <laughs> so it's quite fun <laughs> like it was to think outside the box, but within the box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, Natalie, that does remind me of, um, I love Bradley Whitford's character, uh, Commander oh. Lawrence, and he, within this very structured Gilead, is given different rules, and he's allowed to do different things, and so his costume, his look, is also different. He has his, like, scarf. He, he doesn't have to go by the same rules as the other, uh, commander. So was there a lot of attention paid to that? Like, well, what would that look like? Because he doesn't want to look too different. He's still part of the society, but he makes his look his own. He doesn't have to follow the same rules. Yeah, to me, he remind, uh, to me, he's sort of styled on um, Lord Byron. You know, he's got this Byronic <laughs> character where he's this poet, romanticist, but he's also suffering greatly within him. I mean, he's one of the architects that set up this world, and I, I almost look at it as these crazy dictators that have this vision of of what a society, a correct society, should be, and within himself, Bradley is then living every day to day with the shame of what he had created because he sees how it affects his, his true love, his wife, Eleanor, as she's sliding in and out of, of uh, I guess I want to say dementia, um, until she completely loses it at the end and unfortunately she doesn't make it. Um, he is, he's broken by then. I mean, with his character, basically, I tried to keep him in vests. Uh, we, we would hand stamp linen. Uh, we tried to use all these sort of classic fabrics that, again, from Lord Byron that he would wear at the time, so from you know that 18 late 1800s, mm -hmm. um, and there's even one port, point where he's so irreverent for the, the the commanders, and they decide to have a meeting at his place, and all he does is he doesn't change out of his suit trousers, which actually have a pattern in them, and they're slightly brown, which is also a, a big deviation from the regular commander wear. He just throws the, his commander meeting jacket over top, sort of like eh, whatever, and I'm not going to put on a tie, so there you go, you know, and it's. It was fun to play with that kind of with him where, you know, you could, he's sort of like, I don't care, whatever, <laughs> you come to me. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Burton, um, you were nominated for your work in Mayday, which was right. the finale for uh, season three, big episode. Um, so I want to talk about what the particular challenges were in that episode. And if you can speak uh, and explain a little to us who may not know as much about it, um, what went into the challenges for makeup for that episode? Well, it's everybody's really looking worse for wear, like from the third <laughs> thing, from day one up until season three. So mm -hmm. it's more accentuated, like the dark circles under the eyes. And I'm uh, just looking, nobody's sleeping. So just really bad and distressed looking. Lizzie was more, a little bit more angular looking, uh, you know, like a tougher, a little bit of an edge going on. So I've angled her off. I've got some, a lot more shadows and shading and definitely the, the more bags under the eyes. So just really playing that all up. And even the gang in Toronto, they, they're they actually looking worse. Across the board, everybody's looking <laughs> worse for wear because they've been through, you know, in three seasons, they've been through uh, a lot. So just across the board, everybody's looking a lot worse. More distressed, more worn down. Uh, Paul, for you, it was um, episode 311, Liars. So could you speak to the specifics from that episode then? Which one was it? I'm sorry. Liars, episode, <laughs> episode 311. <laughs> oh my God, that's such a long time ago. It's <laughs> long, yeah. I, I got to try and remember. This is like, oh my gosh. Uh, li uh, I'm sorry, I'm at a blank. Uh, I'm, I don't know. Jezebel. Jezebel. I'm sorry. 
You have to forgive me. They go back to Jezebel's. It's the return oh, of the Jezebel. Jezebel's. Oh, yeah. the Jeze yeah. oh, okay. Jez <laughs> oh, yeah. The Jezebel's had 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 changed over the over the th three seasons and into mm -hmm. the fourth. We had uh, they have gone from being very uh, downtrodden, beat up, very much abused. Uh, then uh, they were later on. Then the, the next season, the Jezebels were not quite as as bad. They were they were they were not clean. They were organ a little more organized. But as you as you get to season three, Jezebels now have become this important thing for the for the commanders to go to. They're very very much put together. Uh, they're very accommodating. Where they are is really nice, and the men are. It seems to change the the commanders while you're there w watching them with the Jezebels. It was really fascinating to watch because it, it, it was very beautiful to look at the makeup and everything, and it, it and the costumes and and also in the hotel where we were, it, it, it all blended and melded so well with and the lighting and it, and it was. So much everybody doing their job, and it hit smack on in season eight. It was extraordinary. Um, some of your jobs seem to go naturally hand in hand together, but others, no, because they're, they're different parts of production. But are there maybe ways that we wouldn't think of um, as fans and viewers that you do have to take into account what someone in another department is doing that will affect yours that may not immediately seem apparent or obvious um, to the viewer who's watching at home? Well, you never want to put somebody in the same color as the couch. <laughs> or, or, you know, kind of I, think we're all kind of right. the, I think we're all on the same page now. We've been together so long, yeah. most of us, that we all kind of have a feel and a vibe of what's going on or what we're going to see once we get to set. So yeah. that, that's great. We've got some amazingly talented people and we all kind of know what we're all going to do ahead of time. So I think that really helps a lot. I think one of the things in casting that's interesting that people don't know is how closely we all work with Robin Cook, who's in Toronto and does such an amazing job with the local casting. So that's a place where you don't want to replicate people looking the same because it's so important that we can distinguish one character from another when they're all in the same costume. So you know, Sherry and Russell and I are working in conjunction with her. We're looking at all her choices. We're studying all the things that she's sending and she's looking at ours so that we, what we do is we put all their pictures on the wall before we cast them and then take a look to make sure that you know you're, you're not seeing the same person and my mother goes which who is that <laughs> you know and for us um for us there's a lot of of course we have costumes and our department are uh, joined at the hip um and also uh post-production uh, special effects and and visual effects in our department because we talk to each other about you know if, if there's anything that our department you know, can't do or it would be cheaper to be done in visual effects or vice versa, we have a, an ongoing conversation throughout the season as to what is more um, financially an intelligent choice and, and, and what visual effects can do to help our department, you know, to do, uh, to deliver a, a good show. Yeah, and, and I work with all the departments uh, with makeup and with uh, uh, wardrobe. Um, in fact, for this episode, uh, I went to Natalie and borrowed a couple of handmaids outfits because we needed to create digital versions of all those handmaids. So um, we had artists at the facility create uh, patterns from the wardrobe uh, so that they can be recreated digitally and stitched together so that flow the right way and, and match the uh, real costumes on set. Um, so uh, same thing with the flags uh, that were designed and the banners uh, that the art department uh, provided. Um, we had scans made of all that stuff and, and uh, we try to match all the details and stuff. And, and, and even as the episode is coming together, Elizabeth will watch an episode and give notes and stuff and try to address the notes, things that we might have missed, things that uh, you know, on second viewing, you realize, oh, there was something in the shot that shouldn't be there or something, you know, we wanted to change or add and stuff. We're constantly all working together, all, uh, um, you know, uh, 
Sorry. Yeah, we're all yeah, we're all we're all uh, closely uh, working together. And for makeup here in wardrobe, we're very close too. Yeah. And, and I actually go to Stephen. Doing. I actually go to affect Stephen quite a bit. Actually, not quite a bit, but yeah. here and there on set to make a little adjustment or. If we use that, can we just maybe, you know, maybe there was a, a gob of blood or something. Can we pull it out or get rid of that? Or so yeah. Stephen and I, Steve and I uh, talk quite a bit. I am not yeah. a Stephen little station quite a bit actually. <laughs> Him and a uh, director of photography and everybody else, but Stephen and I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to know because I, I know we're gonna have to wait longer for uh, season four, but we all love it so much, uh, and we know it, it's not gonna be till next year um, that we get to see it. But are there already conversations going on about what you guys have to do behind the scenes? Because there's tons of conversations about what things have to happen on screen and how everyone's gonna stay safe. What does it mean for your respective departments? What new things do you have to keep in mind with the- Oh boy. <laughs> I think these are things uh, that not everyone knows as much about, but there's still something going to be impacted by all of this. So. Well, uh, having, um, yeah, well, I started officially last week um, and this new COVID world, uh, I have to say is a huge, huge curveball on all, all our departments. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people working remotely. Uh, there's a lot of safety protocols that have been put in place and that are still being put in place. And you know, we're the kind of people who will meet up in the hallway um, and grab someone, you know, between two bites of, you know, bagels and say, hey, you know, I thought about that thing and would you remember this? And then we, we, we do a lot of problem solving around a cup of coffee, you know, standing at the at the craft truck. And and so it's really hard. It's already hard. It's only been a week. And it's really hard to um to to feel like we have I have a handle on what everyone is doing by being so isolated. So that's gonna be a real difficult thing for us, I think. Um, and then just in terms of prep, I mean, there's so much. We did a we did a virtual uh, scout of a location today. Um, you know, everything has to be done remotely, and it's it's quite a challenge. Quite a challenge. Yeah, we've had our first uh, meetings this week, and uh, they're all Zoom meetings, and they're all uh, you know, it's just a different vibe. You know, it's very you know when you're in a room together with everybody, everybody feeds off each other. Um, yeah. Everybody, as Elizabeth says, you know, it's like we'll split off into groups, or we'll, or we'll just catch people in the hallways. We have an idea, and we just want to spitball with somebody. And it's just a lot harder to do that now. It's not, you know, now everybody's kind of in their bubbles and stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's just sort of early days, but yeah. it's, uh, it definitely is a challenge. Yeah, we're all just back this week, so it's hard. But it, it's really going to impact casting in a huge way because, you know. For me, the most fun part of the job, and for all of us, sharing, is being in the room with actors and then seeing them do something and then doing it again and playing with it or giving them a note about what we know, uh, you know, Bruce and Warren and Lizzie are looking for or something they don't know because they don't get the whole script and that will be lost because people will be self-taping, which we've done before, but we'll have to Zoom with them after. And decisions have to be made much quicker now because we'll be, you know, anybody who's traveling to Toronto will have to be quarantined for a certain amount of time. And that's really hard. And as well, you really can't share actors anymore. In other words, if somebody was working on something in New York and they came up for a couple of days to Toronto and then they go back to New York, you, you can't do that anymore. So it, it's gonna be challenging. And just schedule wise, it, it, you know, you have to have an actor come and spend, I don't know how long in a hotel before they can start working. But this is what we have to do and we'll adjust. Yeah. I think we're all happy to be back at work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. From a makeup uh, standpoint too, like I'm usually like this in, in Lizzie's face, every little, you know, little crevice, little mark. So it's hard with all that protective equipment in between, you know, one or two pieces or, or more to get to, to see through that. So it will be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. But we'll make do. We'll make it work. So. And in just in a costume department, I mean, it's impossible to do a fitting without touching someone. <laughs> and, you know, people are speaking about, well, we'll just get some multiples or they can wear long underwear underneath while they put the clothes on. And so there's all these things that are being thrown around that, you know, sometimes 
don't really make sense, but we're trying to protect ourselves. And then the other, you know, the other issue is just often in a costume shop, you've got 20 odd people in a room that's not very large working all together. So there, there's all of a sudden everything now has to be spaced out and we need, you know, barriers, uh, in even in between sewing machines, for example, you know, so it's all of that. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Paul, I imagine you have the same problem going on with her styling. I'm going to miss talking to everybody. <laughs> that, that's what I am being close and sitting in my chair and talking no, about no, no. how your weekend went, what you did on the weekend, what, <laughs> you know, and, and you all, of course you talk about the show, but I, I'm going to miss the social life that, that that's been such a big part of my over 35 years of the business and it's all social and uh, family and uh, it's going to be, it's going to be really hard, very, very, very hard. Oh, although I did see a new mask that's out. <laughs> and you can yeah. see through it. Yeah. I saw that one. Yeah. Did you see it? It's for hearing impaired. Ah, so you can oh, read me, it. me. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem, here's the problem with masks, too. Even if they are see through, you still have a reflective quality yeah. to it. So if I want to see like the skin underneath with that mask, even if it's clear, clear yeah. it's going to affect what you see. Right. So it, it is tough. It's going to be tough. I don't know. I I think we're going to go to the audience Q&A now because I think we have some questions. So let's see. All right. Uh, first up from Nasirin Al-Khatabi. Uh, Elizabeth Williams, where did you find your influences in terms of inspiration for the mood, color, shapes you chose to sculpt this world? Um, well, if we're talking specifically about Washington, uh, we did a lot of research on, you know, various uh, dictatorships. We looked at, you know, some Russia and Korea and, uh, and and various, and we pulled together all of those images and um, and created our own world. Um, in terms of color for Washington, since we had, you know, Boston Gilead is a very warm red brick uh, look. And we had Toronto as a kind of like an eclectic uh, uh, hodgepodge of color. Uh, we liked the fact, of course, we were drawn to it because of the beautiful marble buildings um, in uh, in Washington. But we decided to stay very monochromatic uh, with whites and grays and and a little bit of you know light beiges, and um, and that way the costumes would contrast really well against that. Um, so that that was the main inspiration: our dictatorship regimes, and uh, and and basically just putting all of our world side by side on a big board, and to see what you know what we could bring into the show that was a little bit new visually. Uh, next, from Zoe Tate to all, what was your favorite element of this season? Mm. Mm. All of it. <laughs> like, it's hard picking your favorite child, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I really Lizzie like this. The, Lizzie killing the commander. Yeah, and I was going to say. That was exactly that was what happened. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was, my, that was my favorite. I could hardly wait for that to happen. <laughs> and it was a beautiful episode with the oh, yeah. uh, the score, the music, and and the oh, montage. Yeah. With, um, yeah, putting the commander into the furnace and the sheets. It was absolutely beautiful. I'd say that was my favorite. Yeah, mine too. That was that was amazing. I that think was. we, along with the audience, needed revenge to see that. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah, and, I, and I, from a costuming point of view, um, I really enjoyed doing the. Uh, the gala in in Washington, oh, uh, yes. which I just want to say, after having created 350 handmade costumes that we built everything, plus army and blah, two weeks later the gala was <laughs> shot. So we had uh, 52 ball gowns, each one different, not one the same, plus the cast clothing uh, and uh, same a number of suits. So it was. And what was fun about it was finally I could break out and do shiny things with feathers and fascinators. And, and it was almost like as if it was, um, uh, I always equated it to like a fascist New Year's Eve party where all the hoarders that they hoarded all the good stuff, they're now, you know, flaunting it. And everyone's misbehaving because they're having wine and cigarettes. So, <laughs> so I think that was from costume point of view, that was fun. Like it was, because it was so different. Yeah. Yeah, as for me, it was the, uh... Uh, the episode where Serena burned the house down. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just beautiful the way it all came together at the end. So. Uh, from Jenna Seitzer, question for Burton. What was your favorite look to create? Hmm. Favorite look to create? Um, well, I think it would have to be offered Offered look from the very beginning, the, the get go, just getting all that, you know, the camera test that we did before any shooting started season one, uh, just getting that right, just making it look right and as distressed as it was and worn down and to show, you know, basically stripped down so the audience could see Lizzie's emotion all coming through, just to strip that right down and be like raw, really raw and distressed looking. I believe that was my favorite. And watching season one, like directly from the book, um, all of those characters coming to life was pretty amazing for me, pretty amazing. What's amazing that what Burton does, if I can say just quickly, is because the we work with Lizzie every day, she comes to work and blah, 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 just normal, stripped down as you just said, Burton, but she's beautiful and she's, and she's, you know, sparkly, even when she has no makeup. But what you do to her when she's offered is, you know, you take that even back. You know, you say it's it's giving her it's had her strip back down, but you've actually put that layer on her. So it's, exactly. it's very good work. Thank you, thank you. It's all you know, all the right colors and all in the right spots. And and you know what? There was a scene. There was a the scene or the episode season one where she was locked in the closet there for two three weeks in the bedroom. Uh, and then when Lizzie and I looked at it after the footage, she's like, you know what? Wow, it was like. And she was tweaking at the uh, the shutters, and she had a little bit of um, abrasions on her fingers. But just all that coming together, and when she looked at me, Lizzie, and she said, "You know what? I, just, I still feel beautiful. It was a beautiful shot, and the shots were still, but it looked raw and distressed, and you could feel her emotions. But it was still beautiful. It's, I was happy with that one. It was one of my favorites, actually." We have another question, uh, Diana Caravaggio. About those mouthpieces in Washington, many people wonder, obviously they are removable for the actors, but in the story, are they supposed to be permanent? If so, how are handmaids able to eat? Logistical question. Okay, I can answer this question. So in, in an original script, there was a scene where the handmaid does remove um, the ring um, before she goes to bed. So. The rings are removable. They're all, they're supposed to be removable, removable in the story. That scene, unfortunately, was cut out or, or removed from the script. So it does leave that kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get the fact that you wonder, like, oh, isn't that weird? She can't eat or drink. Um, so that was unfortunate. But yes, the, the, the handmaids can remove the ring to eat and drink. <sighs> Uh, from Carla Waddles, do you think we will see an increase during the pandemic to use visual effects to digitize crowd scenes and scenes with lots of extras? Uh, yeah, it's been discussed. Um, the obviously with uh, social distancing issues, um, we have uh, you know we have episodes with lots of uh, people in them, lots of scenes with lots of, uh, and so the stories are are being rewritten to uh, cut down on how many people might be in a scene. But when situations were forced to have it, um, yeah, we're looking at a lot of different options. Um, the, uh, we can shoot uh, layers of people um, and then composite them all together, or we might have to go with creating digital people. Um, it just depends on what the shots are and, and uh, you know, what's required for the scene. Uh, from Todd Burgess, question for Stephen: What was your favorite visual effects scene to put together for season three? Oh, well, and hands down, it was the Washington Monument scene, what? just because it it was such a challenge. Um, I mean, the whole episode uh, had visual effects throughout, um, but the ending uh, at the monument uh, was definitely my favorite, just because. It, uh, it was the most challenging because the amount of time we had to put it all together and the fact that it had to actually, you know, it had to look flawless. And so there was a, a real push um, to get, you know, the workout as quickly as we could. I mean, we would do versions of the shots. We would send it to editorial. Editorial would cut them in and there would be discussions about how those, uh, uh, what, how, how those shots would play out. Um, those notes would go back to the VFX company and then uh, we'd have to keep going back in and make changes. So, um, yeah, just 
that episode this season for sure, just because of the sheer uh, uh, pressure to get it all out. From Alexa Vela M for Natalie, as the seasons go on and expands in characters and their stories, how do you make sure it fits the aesthetic of the show but still makes them stand out? Uh, you Basically what I had to do from the first two seasons is I had a base to build on and I didn't want to all of a sudden show up and okay, here's a whole new outfit because then that wouldn't make sense in the continuity. So they're just subtle changes that we did like with the veiling. And at one point, Lizzie was given a, a little capelet when they were doing the video that was the um, propaganda video that they were going to send to Canada in a plea bargain for, or in a plea for Nicole. So obviously a continuity of a slight change, but can maintaining the same colors. Um, and I guess the flow, the way the clothes hang and, and move, uh, if that's specifically for the handmaids. Uh, the others is just subtleties of psychology and then trying to figure out if I was in their shoes, what would I wear? For example, with the modern clothing uh, that we saw in Canada. Um, and as, as far as Serena goes, I explained that arc already, how we changed it. And actually, when I was thinking about it, we even did the same thing with <clears throat> um, Fred. His clothing went from very dark to very light because of the happiness that he had had when he was in this outing to being in a suit that actually had a teal color in it as his very last outfit when he was in jail, as sort of a the the, the stage the places had switched places now. In other words, the husband and wife have now switched places in terms of being um, in jail. Uh, Serena is no longer in jail, at least not initially. We think so, but he is, and it was echoed in color. So I was playing a lot with that kind of a thing and keeping it very subtle. Sometimes it was lost because of you know things the way things were shot, but. It's there, I know it's there. So. <laughs> uh, from Valerie Milano, what makes Elizabeth such a dynamic choice for this complex role? I guess I can speak to that, but Elizabeth came with the show. The casting directors did not cast her. Um, they sold the, uh, Bruce and Warren, got the show picked up uh, at MGM by you know, getting Elizabeth involved. And when you get Elizabeth involved in a show, you're dealing, I think, with one of the greatest actresses in the world. And as you've seen from this show and what she is doing outside of the show, her range is extraordinary. Her ability to be completely raw and honest, to let go of any ego and do everything in service of the show, I think is, and her dedication to it, it was is what makes her phenomenal in the role. And then in terms of casting, you have to find actors to match up to her so she doesn't wipe them off the screen. <laughs> um, but I think it's, a, it's, I actually think she's a fantastic producer. And I think that her commitment to her artistry is what makes her contribution to the show as a producer, a real contribution, not just, you know, sometimes people get the producer credit, but I think she takes it very seriously. And I think it's really made the show even better than without her contribution on, you know, as far as the overall show, not just her work. And the availability of, of Lizzie to talk to her at any given moment in time about something that's going to happen is something else. I mean, you know, there's, you don't have to worry. You can ask her and she knows, and she's more than happy to help you and tell you. Uh. Dana Carabajo, for everybody, you love your job, but if you had to choose another department to work in, which one would you choose? Driver. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be in the writer's I room. <laughs> I would want to be in the writer's room. I think that would just be so much fun to watch how it all comes together. That's where I would love to be. Interesting. Um, a long, a long time ago in my schooling, I also did sets as well as costumes. So that's also something that I, I would love to try, put it that way, in a film, in a film environment. I've, I've tried it in theater. So it's a, it'd definitely be another department I wouldn't mind playing in. Uh, for all the departments, there have been some very memorable episodes from the show already. What was the most challenging episode in terms of logistics and all the behind the scenes work? So I wouldn't limit this to this season if there was 
any episode of The Handmaid's Tale uh, that was the most challenging in terms of logistics and all the behind the scenes work. Hmm. For me? I think, it was the, I think it was the gallows, the beginning of season two, the first episode, which was pretty tough. And we were outside, you know, freezing cold, like usual, middle <laughs> <laughs> of no, nowhere. Um, and just keeping the, I mean, and it was very raw, obviously, and real, um, but it was just keeping the girls, you know, their, their, their makeup the way it should be. And, you know, Lizzie's got a bit of an abrasion here. She's got some of the fat happening. So it's just keeping all in keeping with the same look. And it's, it's just tough. And we have to climb the stairs and we're out in the middle of nowhere, freezing cold. So it, it was it was tough. It was a tough one. So it looked um, amazing. It looked amazing. Is, the time was, we were uh, in, in the church, we had 560 plus extras. And that was, that was, and we started at 2.30. It was 800. In the morning. So I, <laughs> that was a challenging day, and morning and day. It was a long 30 day. 2.30 a.m. call time, yes. That was a crazy <laughs> one. That was a crazy one. And uh, we pulled it off, and nobody waited for us, and everybody did such an incredible job. The cruise was just, it was great. It was great. Yeah. Episode 13 of last season was was pretty intense too with all the children in the airplane. Um, that was a that was a challenging episode, but I'd say that they're all challenging in their own right. Um, and I think sometimes um, some, it's harder for one department and harder for another depending on 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 the episode. Yeah. Um, and across the board, I think we all have our, have our, our yeah. Um, yeah. There are some hard ones. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's being on camera right now. <laughs> it's real. And I, I think what happens in casting is when an actor gets a role on The Handmaid's Tale, some light bulb goes off in them and they're just, you know, their confidence level raises. So they go in for other jobs, you know, the ones that aren't series regulars, and they start booking everything else. So it's been really challenging for us, like this season, in season three, for Sam Yeager, for Ashley mm. Lathorpe, because they just start, you know, the writers are writing to them and then they go get a series regular on something else and we have to like get them off of their show for one day to shoot and then our line producer and we're driving Kim Todd crazy because if he doesn't make that plane and if there's bad weather he won't show up that day and they can't shoot it so it can get very nerve wracking. Yeah. That's so. really tough now for day players coming in. Yeah, there be won't be help. such a thing as day players anymore. You'll have to book them for the whole week episode but this is our last question and it's for everyone's so everyone gets to answer uh what advice can you give or one tip that helped you break into your specific industry so let's start with natalie and we'll go around ah what advice let's see I don't really have a tip for breaking in uh is this perseverance and don't think don't be afraid to go for it uh being worried that somebody might laugh at you just go for it the worst thing they can do is say no and then you just try again. Sharon? Uh, I think if you don't love it, do something else because you really, really have to love what you do. I think you have to really love working hard because everybody who becomes successful has a very, really works hard and the, has a great work ethic. And the more successful you get, sometimes the harder you have to work to really make the work stay at a certain level. and don't ever take no for an answer when someone says you can't do that you just say i'm gonna do it <laughs> elizabeth um yeah i'd say tenacity as well um i think humility is very important especially when you're starting um because i don't think you should feel like you're too good for anything um and i think you have to be willing to work your way up uh, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Burton? I, I think know exactly what you want, where you want to go. Just like have a, have a really good plan, but know your passion and, and kind of figure out where you want to go and know what you want to do with it and stick to it and be passionate about it. Steven? Um, God, this, like everybody else said, you have to be passionate about about the career you want to get into. Um, in visual effects, you know, a lot of the artists that work on the show, uh, the work that they do, they would be doing this at home on their own time as a hobby if they weren't getting paid to work on the show. Um, that's, you know, that's really what it's about. It's, it's about, you know, caring about what you want to do and, 
and and putting the time in because it's it is a labor intensive process um you know and it's a lot of uh long hours it's a lot of uh you you, you got to take a lot of criticism um you can't to you can't uh fall in love with what you do you got to be able to to take um uh notes and you got to be able to make changes sometimes you have to start all over again mm-hmm. um but that's that's the attitude you have to have when you when you get into this field and puck well for me there's three is i believe theater is a big help i, I started out in the theater two you just have to go to set and see what it's like to work the hours you work if you can make it you'll be able to do it and three learn by your mistakes you yeah. make a mistake you never do it again yeah wise words mm-hmm. <laughs> right. advice to end on so <laughs> thank you everyone for joining me today i really appreciate it it was great having you all uh thank you to our audience um be sure to take advantage of our free trial of rap pro so you can be the first to know about upcoming events and screenings like this one so thank you all